Um, I, I just first like to start by, by thanking you for taking the time to, to, to come here and be with you today. Um, from the list of productions I just listed off there, you're obviously incredibly busy. Um, how do you find the time? I don't have the time. Um, I mean, I, I started um, when I when I came into the West End um, in about 2001. There was me, and I didn't even have an assistant. And I now have um, working full time, sort of flanking me, 40 people, um, and outside of that, sev several thousand more. So um, I rely now on the most extraordinary team of professionals around me to support me and enable me to keep following these ideas and, and, and um, even call it dreams that I have. But it's much, much harder to find the time now. I mean, I have... Um, I, I actually lose count, but I think at the moment um, I have six, seven shows in the West End, <coughs> one about to go into rehearsals, two, three on Broadway. I mean, I literally can't remember. Um, <laughs> one in rehearsals in Australia, a production about to go to San Francisco, and and um, I would I, I'd guesstimate at least 10 to 12 productions in, in core key development right now that may or may not, but hopefully will, come into the West End or New York in the next 12 months. So that's an incredible output of work. Um, and even if I say so myself, and, and it's, it's as much, if not more so, than the National Theatre. But we do it on, with no subsidy, um, and we do it on, on, a, on a much smaller um, payroll. So I don't have very much time. I mean, pe people who know me know that I don't ever have holidays, that I'm still writing, working, reading, emailing, well into the early hours, and then up again really early. So I'm, I don't get much sleep. I'm not complaining. I absolutely love it, but there's simply no way one could do the amount I do um, and have a life. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so coming here, I had to say yes because there are sort of things um, in my life. You know, coming to talk to you at Oxford is a big, big, big deal for me because I didn't go to university, I didn't have a great education. And Oxford to me was, was so far away from anything that was ever possible for me. And I mean, I know that you all know how lucky and privileged you are to be here, but I'm telling you, you really are, because it's an extraordinary opportunity you've got and I didn't have this and so to be invited along to talk to you at this point of your lives and your careers is really special for me. Well I mean uh, at the stage that we are um, for yourself you're already well involved with the, the theatre uh, in, in various roles. How important do you think it is to get that experience at a, at a young age? <coughs> uh, it, it, well it, it depends what each of you want to go and do. Um, I didn't know I wanted to be a producer when I was was um, in my teens. I knew I wanted to work in the performing arts in some way. Um, the only w the only reason I've produced as much as I've produced is because I started so young, and I started so young because from the age of fourteen I was working in theatre. So fourteen, fifteen in in the school holidays, I was um, working backstage. I was dressing. I was um, then I was, when I was 16, I started ushering. I did anything I could possibly do to earn money, but more, more importantly, to get anywhere in a theatre. So by the time I went to drama school, which was when I was 18, to do, I didn't want to act. I knew I didn't want to act. I was, wouldn't have been a very good actor, um, but I wanted to do something. And the only course that was available was a stage management course at that time. So I just put myself on a stage management course. By the time I was 18, I went on to that stage management course at Central School of Speech and Drama. I'd already had 
about three years of experience. So I went into that course with actually quite a good CV already. And then I carried on working. So by the time I left drama school, I worked in every school holiday and, and I'd done quite a lot. So unusually, by the age of 21, I'd already had probably, you know, at least 10 or 12 credits, which mattered. And they were credits that were, have, have helped me all the way through my life because yes, now I'm a producer and yes, now I'm, I'm, um, I've got a, I, I, I'm the boss, if that's the word, but I understand what the follow spot operator has to do and I understand how everybody fits into a production. Um, and if you hadn't done, if I hadn't done that, I don't think I could do the job I do now, hopefully as well as I do it. And you were mentioning before how, just how busy you are. Um, so what is it, is it about um, taking on a new show that excites you? What does that new show have to have about it that oh, makes you go, yes, OK, well, I'll add it to the, it's, the calendar? It's, a, it's, the, it's the most impossible question to ask because also uh, the, I, come, I come at a production from many different ways. So I can, um, I can commission a play um, um, and I can option a play that it, it's that, that already exists. I can go and see a play um, at, at one of the subsidised venues. Um, an actor can come and pitch a play to me. A director very often will come with an idea. And it's about a feeling. It's just about what, what I mean, d d when I see something or if I read something, particularly if I don't know it, it I, I will, I will, unplug and I will disengage, disengage if I know what's going to happen. So if I'm ahead of the story, if I'm ahead of the narrative, um, I'm not excited and, in ver and, and usually, this is on the new work, and usually I won't pursue it. Mm -hmm. If, however, that story takes me to a place I had no idea I was going and pulls a rug from underneath me and, and gets me thinking about the world or that subject that it's talking about in a completely different way, and you go on a go on an experience, a joint shared experience with the audience. You just know, you just know when you're at something special. Um, and as I say, and particularly if I don't know where it's going, I'm really, really then excited about something. So one of the the, the newer shows that you've um, helped bring um, to the stage is um, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Um, Harry Potter obviously having a, a story that's quite close to Oxford now. Um, were there any unique challenges bringing such an iconic character um, into a, 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 new, a new medium? Um, and were there, uh, connected to that, any expectations that you had to deal with? Well, look, that's, this is a four-hour answer. Um, so I'll try and do it really quickly, shall I? Um, obviously, um, adapting Harry Potter for the stage was always going to be... Um, a very big risk and a very big challenge because the expectations with a half billion fan base out there and a generation of Harry Potter lovers, um, there was a huge amount of expectation. However, uh, that isn't that was not my way in. The 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 the, the it was actually a very s simple idea, um, and the very simple idea was. What would Harry Potter be like as a dad, as an adult? Anybody who knows their Harry Potter knows that the, 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 the epilogue um, in the series ended with, with Harry, 19 years later, waving his middle son, Albus, off to Hogwarts. And that's how it ended. And I wondered what happened next. Um, and um, we, my, my co-producer partner and I, we took the idea to JK Rowling. Uh, we knew that she wasn't interested in, in um, adapting her, her books for the stage. We knew that she wasn't interested in musicals. Obviously, that's what everybody else had been trying to do. But she did connect with the very simple idea of storytelling. And we talked, as I talk about with many directors and writers and actors, about... Um, the, the power of the imagination, what theatre can do that films 
TV and sometimes novels can't do, which is you can connect as a community in a theatre as one, go on a shared experience with a story. You don't need CGI, you don't need um, video and film. I mean, obviously in some pieces of work they're great, but with this story, uh, I felt initially that if you could tell a story about a dad, a flawed dad, a complicated dad who happened to also be the most famous wizard in the world, what would that be like? And, and that she loved that idea and we were, I was given the platform to go off and develop it. And then at the point where the director, um, a great colleague and friend of mine, John Tiffany, I met him and he loved the idea. He happened to have read all the books. He knew the books inside out. Um, and he's the one with Jack Thorne, the playwright, who then took it to the next level, which is said to me, look, it'll be a bit boring, won't it? Just to have Harry just moaning on about being a dad. You need, you need an adventure, you need magic, you need illusion, you need, and, and, then, and then off we went. And they created, we created um, this story that evolved in time. Now, to your question about the expectations, all the way through the process, my job, our job as the producers was to protect the creative team. And I, do, I like to think I do this on, on most of the shows I produce, protect the creative team um, from, the, um, from the, the outside noise, from the world, particularly in this world of social media now, where there is so much noise all the time. Um, and and we, we, we created this production in secret for a couple of years. No one knew we were doing it. There was a code word for the show. Um, we quietly got on and did it. And amazingly, no one ever, you know, the, the secret kept. Um, and, um, and I think because we were able to quietly produce it and develop it away from the noise, that the, actually we, we didn't have to figure out the expectations. We just got on and we believed if we'd created a good piece of theatre in its own right, um, we might have a chance. Mm. And of course, <coughs> that's now um, moved over to, to Broadway and is having a incredible success over there as well. Um, and I was reading before um, some comments you made about commercial theatre mm -hmm. and what you thought of, the, thought of that. And obviously the, um, the production of The Cursed Child on Broadway is due to be the most expensive production in Broadway for an, a non-musical. Mm -hmm. um, where do you think the line is drawn between commercial theatre and kind of, you know, stuff that is pro-creative and pro-art? Oh, um, I can't, I can't get into the headspace of ever creating something because it might make money or it might make a lot of money or it might roll out and be exploited across the world. If, if I went to that space, if I went to that place, I think I, I, I would, I would, I'd be paralysed. So Harry Potter did end up, has ended up being a very, very expensive production. But that's because it's two, it's two plays and it's 40 actors. And it's just, it's just, you know, it's multiples. And, and it wouldn't have been that expensive if it was one play and we wouldn't be having this conversation. It happens to be a very big piece of theatre. And to create such simplicity with the illusions and the magic cr takes an incredible amount of time and development and money. Um, but um, I do work in the commercial theatre, uh, or, or rather I work in an area where we don't have subsidy. Um, but I try to create the work with the same integrity and the same um, support um, that any creative team or acting company would have if they were in the, the subsidised sector. Um, the difference is that the risks are so much higher commercially because a production can cost many, many, many millions. Plays now cost many hundreds of thousands. Um, when I started producing plays, they were 
you know, maybe 150,000, 200,000 pounds for a play. And that was also expensive, but, but, but now, you know, um, they're, they're, they tend to be anything between sort of 750,000 for a mid-scale size play, million plus for a slightly larger play. And musicals, God knows, you know, it can go, you know, you can go up to 40 million. So do you think, um, following on from that, do you think it's now a concern that it's maybe too hard to actually put on um, a big show on um, Broadway or the West End without the kind of connections that you yourself have? You've obviously reached a stage in your career where you can go, um, this is what I want to do, this is kind of who I want to do it with, and it will well, just about get there. I mean, obviously, I... Uh, no, I mean, I... Uh, I, I you... I don't think that's what one should be aiming for at this at this stage in your lives. Um, I wasn't when I was a young producer aiming for you know global domination. Um, I, I, I just wanted to put on shows. Some of them would run longer than others. Um, my first Broadway show was in two thousand and one. Um, so that, you know, I'd been going at it still then, you know, a good five or six years, you know, properly um, before I got my first New York transfer. Um, but I think that's not what one should be aiming for. And I'm certainly not aiming for that. And I think there's, there's a sense that every show I produce, there's going to be this, this natural route to Broadway. No, all I'm trying to do is on every show I produce or want to get involved in, is figure out why I'm wanting to do it, who I think might want to see it, and why they might want to see it, um, and work out where in London usually it should be. Should it be in a small theatre? Should it be in a larger theatre? Should it be for 10 weeks? Should it be for 12 weeks? Should it be for 16 weeks? And take it from there. Um, but never, never sort of aim for, um, you know, the, the, the big, long-running, um, sold out, transferred show, um, and you know, and a lot of the stuff I do, people aren't even aware of because it will. I'll, I'll, I'll give seed money or enhancement money um, to enable it to happen um, outside of the glare of the West End, and that play may never go on beyond its initial life in that theatre, and I've enabled that to happen, walk away quietly, and it doesn't transfer, um, and that happens a lot. Um, and that's great because you're, you're, you are enabling and, and, and supporting the work, but you're not necessarily exposing it mm. um, if it's not ready to be exposed. So do you think that you now have um, almost a res some kind of responsibility within the industry to bring those maybe more challenging, less conventional pieces um, to the stage? Um, or is, are you still very much um, captured by whatever? Well, look, it's, no, no, it's not a responsibility to the industry. It's a, it's, 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 <coughs> it's a responsibility to myself. It's what I want to do. Um, and I think having, um, having an element of success behind you and having some long-running shows in your life that give you some foundation, some security, means that I can figure out and think about wanting to do some types of work which aren't, which are even less commercially obvious um, and will enable me to support the most extraordinary and challenging and diverse work, mm. which I'm doing right now. And I'm in a, I think I'm in, a, uh, um, it was interesting, there was, a, a, I watched a programme that was done on myself earlier in the week and, and it was about it was filmed about 10 or 11 months ago and I said in it I'm at the most fertile time of my life and I shouted at the television I said no you're not you are now and that's that's what's exciting is I think each t each year I think I'm challenging myself more and I'm doing even more exciting work than I could ever ever have imagined but I have no idea what's coming at me this time next year right now in the West End I've got a um, a, a, a two-part play called The Inheritance um, and it's, it's a remarkable play um, that looks back on um, the AIDS crisis of the 80s but it's set now 
and it's absolutely beautiful and it's profound and it's well day today, tomorrow and it feels, you know, this morning I was planting a tree with Sadiq Khan to commemorate World AIDS Day and that was because of that piece of theatre and then round the corner we had the jungle which was about the refugee crisis that's going on in the world particularly focusing on Calais. Now those two pieces of work are about as uncommercial as you could imagine but thanks to the other side of my life and my work I can I can choose and I will do this sort of work. As it happens they're both also critically and, and commercially very successful but and who'd have thought that the jungle would have, would have, as it were, been a going concern? But it is, because it's really, really good. Um, and um, I, I, I've always had this belief that if something's very good, and if something has the ability to stand out from the crowd, and if it's, and if it's got a good business model around it, but at its heart, creatively, it's authentic and um, there's nothing cynical about it. I believe audiences um, will go and follow that type of work. I think audiences also sniff out cynical theatre. I think they will sniff out something that's about, um, just about money. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and so, um, Great theatre can live and thrive in any space. It can live and thrive in a tent, it can live and thrive in, in a tiny pub theatre, and it can live and thrive in a, in a big proscenium arch in the West End. Mm. So um, um, I think it would now be a nice time to open up some questions from, from the audience. I'm sure you've got some um, far more interesting questions than I do um, to, to ask her. So if you do have a question you'd like to ask, if you want to raise your hand and we'll send a mic over to you. And um, we'll start with the uh, gentleman at the back there. Yeah. Uh, hi, so I'm somebody who doesn't really have much in the way of like experience with theater. I can't really remember the last time I was uh, at a play. So I'm sort of wondering how does theater as a medium compare with say film? And so, 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 like, what is it about this medium that that allows one to express, I guess, unique things, and what gives gives it this enduring interest? Are you saying you don't go to the theatre? Yeah, I, I usually don't. Yeah, that's why I ask. So why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm interested in all kinds of things. I, um, so it's not so new. I think I mentioned it before. The the thing about theatre is um, the the shared experience with an audience. Um, the fact that you can hear a story, you can look at the actors. I'm looking at you. We're connecting, aren't we, today? Um, it's about connection um, and ab about going on a, a journey with a story, with a group of people around you and being able to look at the actors' eyes if they're, if, if they're connecting with you and being taken on, on a place. And, and it, can be, it can be a serious story, or it can be a great big musical with tap dancing and singing and dancing. And, and it, can, it, it can be any form of genre, but the shared experience is that, you know, I'm doing a musical called Dream Girls at the moment in the West End. And that shared experience at the end of Act One, when the audience are are screaming because the power of the voice and the excitement and hearing those vocals just I'm tingling now thinking about it um, that can't you can't recreate that on film you get a different emotional reaction on film in the theatre everybody around you you feed each other you have to go to see theatre to understand what I'm talking about <laughs> Thank <you. laughs> thanks um, yeah we uh, moved on down to the uh Hi, um, I actually have an offer to do creative producing at Central um, next year, so um, with that in mind, um, what advice would you give for new and up and coming producers coming into the industry as it stands with the um, budgets as they are? Um, you, the successful producer, the good producer, you have to have two parts of your brain and it's there, there has to be the creative, the inspirational, the ideas, but there has to be a business side. And that um, I will say to any young producer, 
please don't ignore the business side. And it's the business side that people are not interested in. They're not interested in about the budgets, the contracts, the, the financial structures. Actually, the very basic thing about communication with theatre owners, with actors, with directors, um, and about putting across your business model. Now, that is essential. However, it must never, never be the thing that dominates the other side, which is the creative. Um, but p I, I, I urge you to make sure that they always run in parallel. But the creative must al always be the dominant, the, the dominant force. And you will know if the, if the business plan isn't going to back it up at the right moment. Um, and, and figure out why you want to be a producer. Don't do it for money. Don't do it for power. Do it because you have something you want to share. Um, I became a producer because I couldn't act. I couldn't sing very well. My sister's a singer. I wanted to sing. She did it better than me. My brother's a mu musician. I couldn't, didn't, he did it better than me. I, I didn't think I could direct. I wanted to write, but I couldn't do it well enough. What did I, but I had things I wanted to say and I had things I wanted to share. So work out why you want to produce. Um, and think about the stories that you want to enable artists to create. The best producing is the producer who can spot and support the new emerging directors and writers and actors. And you are the person, you are that really important person that can say to them, I'll make this happen for you. Because every great director and writer and actor needs a producer somewhere in the picture to allow them to go and do their job. And just remember where you are in that process and never get to the point where, where you think you can do it without them because <laughs> you can't. It's, you know, and, and, and I, I'm in that strange place in my career now where I'm sitting here talking about being a producer, but I'm still very humbled and I'm still, um, every show I do, I'm in awe of the creative team. I'm in awe of what the director and the writer and the actors and the musicians <laughs> and the designers and everybody around it. I, I, I'm in awe of it and I'm a fan. And I will never, if I ever stop being the fan, I will stop doing what I do. Does that make sense? And ju just to quickly follow up, follow up on that, um, for those who are maybe um, interested in kind of going into the, the industry, what do you think are the biggest challenges for the industry as a whole um, in the, in the uh, coming years, or the ones that you've found from your time uh, going through that the have emerged? Well, it depends what perspective you're coming from. Um, if I were... Um, one, of the biggest in one of the biggest challenges is Arts Council funding. That's always been a big challenge. It's getting it's getting bigger. Um, I don't I don't I don't get Arts Council funding directly, but I work with a lot of organisations and obviously many many directors and writers and actors who come through the subsidised sector. Um, that's a massive challenge. The reason why we are the greatest um, country in the world for theatre is because of our Arts Council funding. And if that were to go. Um, it would, it, our, our whole social fabric and our whole cultural world would just disintegrate. Um, so I think, you know, in the biggest sense, that is our biggest challenge. Um, and, we'll, we'll, and ever since I started working theatre, it's been a challenge and, and it will continue to be one. Um, and um, um, in, in my work, in my line right now, um, one of the biggest challenges is, um, let's call it the, net, net, the Netflix era. Um, the, um, the fact that there are so many other areas, so many other things for people to do at night. 
Um, not just, not, not, you know, obviously we've always had television and movies, um, but now we, you know, we, we have um, this generation where, and I'm sure everybody here, you know, many of you probably don't have tellies, it's all just about watching, binge watching, um, Netflix watching, and bar culture, uh, nightclubs, so many other things for people to do. And so the challenge is how do I get people into our work? get them to see our shows um, when there's so much competition out there um, and the Netflix um, phenomenon has also actually become quite a critical issue for things like casting because um, uh, it's, it's a fantastically ripe and fertile time for actors because there's so much, so so many places they can now work. Um, and so trying to convince people to come into theatre now for 12 weeks, for 14 weeks, for 16 weeks, um, is, is, a, is, a, is a bigger challenge as it's ever been. Um, and um, particularly the star actors who everybody wants to see. Um, so everybody's after the same people. To, could do, you know, and so that's that's a big challenge. Um, was that uh, no, yeah, sorry for in, uh, interrupting the um, the Q and A session. Um, but yeah, if we go to uh, the uh, woman on the third row. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm a huge fan of your work, so it's um, just. I know you said it's a privilege to be here, but it's a privilege for us. It's just, yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask how you, you kind of talked about creating that developmental space for new directors and writers and actors kind of coming up. Um, I specifically wanted to ask, you know, how you find kind of the new writing talent, um, you know, in terms of playwriting or composing or lyricists, kind of all of that, and how you kind of work to develop them. Um, well, it's really hard for me right now because I've, I'm so busy that I don't have the time to do as much research and thinking time and quiet time as I would like. I do have a very good um, and growing development team around me. But, so what I'm relying on right now is um, what's in the ether. And I'm relying on people coming to me saying, go and see that. There's something really interesting going on around the corner or, or over, you know, up, up, up in Scotland or something. And, and that the, my, my, my team will get on a train and they'll go and see the work and then they'll report back. And, then, and so it's like a bit of a filter process at the moment. It used to be me doing it. And now I'm relying on people who know my taste and know me a little to, to do a lot of it for me. Um, it's very, very, very rare that a new play will arrive on my desk unsolicited by somebody I don't know and I would produce it. In fact, it sort of, it sort of never would happen like that. Um, uh, though those plays will possibly end up at maybe in a, in a, in a studio theatre somewhere or a new writing venue. Um, so the, 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 the new plays I get sent now tend to be by pretty well-known, established writers. Um, um, but um, an example of, of supporting new great talent, um, I've just done it just recently with a play called uh, Tennessee Williams, Summer and Smoke. Um, a, a, a pretty unknown director, female director called Rebecca Frecknell. Um, she... Uh, is an incredibly brilliant, new, very young, visionary director. I saw this production of Summer and Smoke with an with a outstanding company led by this actress called Patsy Ferron. Neither of them are known, but I went to see it and I thought, the world needs to see this work, needs to see this talent. I had no idea if it was going to be commercially successful. We only opened it 10 days ago. But that is an example of what I can do now. I can see this type of work and say, this is our future. And instead of it staying where it was and running for a few weeks and then disappearing, I've given it this platform, which I hope 
means that this director and this actress and the company around them will um, go on, be recognised and have many, many more opportunities now as a result of my leap of faith in them. And it's certainly, um, so far, it's, it's working out because um, it's very, very satisfying having a West End theatre full, watching a play and a production that you had a hunch about. And there's nothing on paper other than it's really good and it's visionary and it's original that would get people through. So you're, people are sort of trusting your own gut at this point, an instinct on something. Um, and so it's very satisfying when, when that pays off. And I don't mean pay off financially, I mean pay off creatively. Amazing. Um, if we go to the um, man just at the back there. Why do you think that um, the price tag of putting on theatre productions has gone up so much in the last 20 years? Oh. Um, well, actually, it's, it's, thankfully, we're not as bad as New York. Are you talking about in London or New York? Uh, London, maybe. Yeah, London. Um, marketing. Although, actually, interestingly, marketing is shifting because now social media is becoming so powerful that... Um, you can take a, a full page ad in the Sunday Times and it doesn't do anything now, but a social media frenzy after a preview can. It's really exciting. Um, and that costs you nothing. Um, <laughs> the theatres are very expensive. Um, just, you know, the renting out of a, theater, of a West End theatre can be very expensive. But it's still... Um, a play can it's a play can cost 120 150 thousand pounds a week to run now um, and probably about 25 percent of that will be the theater cost um, obviously depends on the scale of it the creative actors I mean just before you know it it all adds up the royalties um, but um, uh, the economics are such that, um, particularly on Broadway, but the economics are, are such that, that your play needs to come out of the gate and be a hit quite quickly, because otherwise it's going to be losing money. Um, uh, and depending on how big your reserve is, um, that could run out quite quickly. Um, so it's expensive, but it's not, it's not out of control yet. Um, and it does mean, I mean, there are always uh, this annual report about ticket prices being through the roof, which in some cases they, there are, but, but all the good and all the, all the shows that you may want to see, you can still get in for 20, 25, I'm not doing a marketing pitch here, but you can still get in. It's slightly harder to get hold of those tickets, um, but we're not, it's not out of control yet. It seems like a lot of money. Um, but it will be out of control when we have to charge the prices you have to charge on Broadway, which is, can be many, many, many hundreds of dollars for a ticket. Um, and I do think the costs are out of control on Broadway. Um, I know this is going public. I've said it publicly many times. I, I wish it were other. Um, plays should not cost a million dollars a week to run, but they do. Um, <coughs> if we go to the uh, the woman on the front row. Hi, um, I was so there's probably a song lyric or a line from a poem that can summarise this a lot better than I can. Um, but I was talking to a friend earlier about um, the kind of phenomenon about how it's so easy to see um, a powerful woman or a strong woman or a woman in charge and label her as bossy or like just automatically go, oh she's arrogant because she believes in herself or um, like the Fringe last year did. Um, a big talk on women in technical theatre and about how it's overwhelmingly male because of like the biases um, that are in, in the industry. I was just wondering about the kind of conflicts you've come across in that and how you've dealt with them. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, the amount of times I've been called frightening. <laughs> um, yes, bossy. Um, a bitch. You know, it, it, it's happened a lot. Um, and 
I don't think of myself as frightening. I think of myself as strong and I think of myself as clear sometimes um, about what I'm trying to do. Um, funnily enough, I literally only had this conversation with somebody yesterday, a man, who said to me um, that, he, did, that he, he was calling a female colleague of mine arrogant. And I challenged him on it and I said, what do you mean by that? I said, is that because she's confident and she's clear about what she's wanting? And I said, I'm challenging you. He was a friend, he's a friend. I said, I'm challenging you. Would you call a man arrogant for having the same clear opinions? And I said, I'm going to ask you just to go away and think about that. <laughs> now, of course, he'd have thought I was frightening saying that. <laughs> but, um, of course, we're going through a revolution right now. And it's very exciting that I can actually have that conversation with a man right now. And he comes back at me and he's listening. I couldn't have had that conversation with that person two years ago. Because I'd have felt nervous of doing so, I'd have felt nervous of his reaction, but, but, but we are going through an incredibly exciting period for both genders, for all genders, I think. Um, I, given the way I was brought up and my, my, my life experience has meant that, that I've always had an issue with authority and so um, I've I've always been a little bit of a terrier and I've always fought back and I've never really known how to deal with the word no. Um, and so um, that's not to do with being a, a, a female, that's just to do with who I am. Um, and I've always been a bit of a fighter. So I'm not necessarily your, you know, an example of um, female empowerment. I'm just, it's, I'm an example of somebody who had a particular upbringing, um, who was thrown out into the world um, and had to just sort of fend for herself and get on with it. Um, but yes, it's, it's um, never be afraid of being clear, of being strong, of being um, opinionated, but be aware that there's always going to be a counter opinion. Listen all the time. Um, and um, I, I think a female producer can have a huge amount of assets uh, because there's this sort of maternal thing that we can bring with it too. Um, sorry guys, I'm sure you can do the same, but, but, but a, a, a female producer can, can also have, have that going for her as well. Um, so, you know, like a mother figure. Um, I don't, uh, is that your answer to your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, if we go to the, uh, the man just on the uh, fourth row. Um, thank you, Sonia, and thank you for taking the time. Um, I saw the uh, ferryman last year at the Gilgood and it was oh, absolutely great? fabulous. Yeah, we're running really on, brilliant. Yeah, we're on Broadway right now. There you go, actually. That feeds really nicely into my question because I wanted to ask about, I'm really curious about the, the differences and the similarities, although more so the differences between the West End and Broadway, um, apart from money. So in terms of actually kind of taste and reception. Um, so um, if you have a success on in the West End, or is there something that would work in the West End, and it, you know, by virtue of that, it will work on Not Broadway, or and no. vice versa? No, yeah, I, mean, I, I thought you might no. say that. So, what kind of? <laughs> Look, it's really hard. What to, are the differences? Oh gosh, it's really hard to answer that question Thank because um, there are. Look, at, at, at its very fundamental level, there are some pieces of work which are quintessentially and socially about being British, um, about living here in this country, that, that just might not cross over, might not be, frankly, interesting to an American audience. Um, and um, so, um, w w and, and when I'm thinking about a piece of work, I, I will never think about, will this go to America? Um, but at some point in its process, that conversation will happen. Um, and, and then 
I contradict myself because then you take something like Jerusalem to Broadway, which is, could not be more about England. Um, and it's a phenomenon there. Um, and it's huge there. All the, um, so, um, or King Charles III, which um, we took over, which, because that's about the royal family, I felt, mm, I think, you know, the, the Americans, I think they'll, they'll, they'll really connect with, with, because they love our royal family, um, and they love Shakespeare and King Charles III, which you may or may not know, was um, set slightly in the future. Um, and Charles was on the throne and was, was having, you know, um, a dilemma about whether he could or could not speak out politically about the world when he's the king. And it was so spot on. And it was also done through the lens of Shakespeare and the history plays. And I thought that would work in New York because they love Shakespeare and they love our royals. Um, and so I think um, sometimes you just have to boil it down to some, 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 some bare essentials. The, the other thing that American audiences absolutely love um, are, are British star actors. So I've, I've produced um, several plays with Mark Rylance on Broadway. But when Mark Rylance was first went to Broadway, nobody ever heard of him. And that was a massive risk. And I look back on it now, I don't, know, I don't even know whether I would have taken that risk now. Um, I think the great thing, this is another sort of note, really, to anybody who wants to be a producer. The great thing about when you're starting is you don't know what can go wrong. Um, and you don't know how difficult it is. And that's, that's the same for any job, isn't it? Um, and that what I try and keep is that sense of um, not knowing and try to ignore all the precedents and all the difficulties and all the reasons why I shouldn't be doing it based on experience and always try to become that young producer that I was when I was setting out. So when I took Boeing Boeing to Broadway with Mark Rylance, which was a 1960s sex farce, which on paper should never, ever, ever have worked because there was nothing about it that rang hit. It only, it, it screamed flop. Um, <laughs> that um, if I'd listened to everybody around me say, you can't do that. Nobody wants to see that play. If I'd listened to everybody around me, I would never have happened. And there are many, many, many examples of work that I believed in, that I loved, that people around me, investors, um, colleagues, family, saying, are you sure? Yeah, don't, why would anyone go, that sounds awful. And, and the, the, the dilemma of the job I've got is the only way you can test it is by doing it and by putting it out there. And, and I want to still have that sense of, let's try it. Let's just see what happens. But of course, everything for me now is just that bigger scale and that bigger risk. Um, so it's harder to do now, but I still want, I still try and retain that sense of the young producer who doesn't care about what other people think. That's a long-winded answer. No, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> that kind of self-belief is exactly why I decided to do a PhD in the humanities. Thank you. Right, thank you. <laughs> um, and then if we go to uh, the woman on the third row just there. Might make this, make this the, uh, the, the last question as we... Uh, wrap up. Hi, thank you so much. Um, you mentioned the rise of social media and, and marketing in that way. I wondered um, what your thoughts are on how influential professional theatre critics are these days, particularly, you know, I've, I've read a few years ago, you know, if the New York Times didn't rate something highly, then it, it wouldn't have such success or longevity on the stage. And I just wondered your opinion on um, the, whether there is a rise in, in user kind of reviews and the power of that or, or where um, the balance is. I, I, I think it's still slightly too early to answer the question fully, but I would say we are in a, we're, we are certainly watching very closely to see what happens to theatre criticism. I know 
that I know that I still think it's very powerful to have that authority, that, that critic who an audience and who a readership understand their knowledge, their taste, their experience, their background, um, and that they will support it. The, the, there's no question that you know, when I open up, the critics still matter enormously, and I still see the difference. So the inheritance, the jungle, summer and smoke, these two, three plays I've just opened in London, all of them, I have to say, did very, very well, got you know, four, five star reviews, mainly five star, and you, overnight you see the box office just absolutely sore. So of course there is still, um, they still are very important, but the, the, the difference is, is now the consensus is then supported by social media. So that word is then spread out and out and out and out by the people who are supporting the work through Twitter or through Instagram, so they can magnify what they already think. Um, and so the critic can support them, and this critic can underline or, or help us get to the next stage. A critic can't help, can't make you a hit unless the audiences and the people are loving it, but they can certainly kill your show. But usually, if the critics are hating it, the audiences probably aren't loving it that much either. Um, in New York, in New York, um, it is still for plays in particular, the power of the New York Times. Um, and social media is, is, is important, but the New York Times, which I think is still a challenge, is still the most powerful newspaper. Um, and, and the interesting thing in the, about the New York Times is you can have um, 20 great reviews in New York for a piece of work and a bad New York Times and everybody is saying you've got a flop and vice versa you can have a great review in the New York Times and everyone else will say it's terrible and you've got a hit so it is really just about the New York Times but and this is back to the social media and the power of word of mouth the New York Times can't m they can't make a hit anymore uh, it will it will do it will have some difference um, at the box office, but it's again the word of mouth and it's the audience and social media and all of that that's getting much more powerful. But the New York Times can definitely close your show. It can definitely definitely close your show if it hates you. Well, on, on the note of closing shows, um, I think that. Um oh, don't end on that. <laughs> <laughs> end on something so negative well I, I, I was actually I was actually going to ask um, just before we left um, what, what what's next for, for Sonia Freeman what, what can we expect coming in the pipeline um, or do you not even know I don't know <laughs> well on that mysterious note um, um, just before we leave if um, anyone is wanting to hear more um, I would really recommend checking out um, the um, newest episode of the South Bank show uh, which aired this week which uh, features Sonia um, and she goes into more detail on some of the things we discussed today, but also some more interesting topics as well. So go check that out. Um, and I have some really nice coats. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's filmed during the winter. Yes, yeah. In New York, yeah. Um, so yeah, so if you, if you want a, a snowy New York as well, you get that as well. Yeah. Um, but um, for today, um, if you please give me give a, a warm thank you to uh, Sonia. <laughs>